Okay, thank you. And uh, even though I'm a nutritionist, I'm not going to talk much about nutrition because there's other talks here relative to nutrition. So we're going to talk about some other factors. I want to ask you a question. Before there were cows in the U.S., and we only had buffalo and bison, what percent of our current methane emissions from ruminants did we have then? Anybody know? Got the same amount? More. More? Less. Uh, you're, you're all pretty close. <laughs> Dan's got an answer here. It, it depends on estimates of the size. Oh, the sure does. Health and animal we, all, we all know that. But the estimates run around 85%, probably Correct. the best guess. Okay. Um, but pretty hard. We're good. We'll get there. So, Hannah, you're, you're all doing really good on that one because I think that's important. Okay. If we just start here real quick, you've seen this before, in the U.S. using EPA data, ag's about 8, and dairy's about 0.5 percent, okay? This is the answer, one answer, there's another paper I found which is not very different in terms of the percentage, but depending on your assumptions, as Dan pointed out, you know, how many bison were there, how big are they, bing, 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 Alex Ristall at Penn State estimated it was about 86 percent of the current. That was back before there were ever any cows in the U.S. In fact, only Indians and, buff and bison. So I think it's quite interesting. Okay, let's move ahead. And the industry has made this commitment, right? You're all aware of that. We're in the dairy industry. And as you look at the carbon footprint of milk, why are they looking at the dairy farm? Because about 72 percent of the total uh, carbon footprint of a gallon of milk is either in milk production or feed production. So that's why we're looking at dairy farms as a primary factor to help the industry move the total way. Now, <clears throat> let's all, I took, we, we're using a herd in New York as part of our uh, dairy cat project out of Wisconsin for whole farm modeling. And and that was used in some of his models too. Um, <clears throat> I pulled this data that we're using. Where it has about 1,100 cows plus heifers and dry cows. They have 22, 2,300 animals. And we used the model to look at each group, the rations from the nutritionist, and calculate methane emissions from each of the groups because we were trying to find out of the total methane emissions of the farm, where are they sitting in these different animal groups? And basically, if we look at this, um, the dry cows are about 8% of the total, and the two groups of heifers add up to about 15% of the total. The rest of that is milking cows. So basically, you know, 25%, give or take, 30% is replacement animals and dry cows, non-productive animals. So that's important as we think about how do we change the emissions on these farms. So how do we decrease it uh, per unit of milk produced? And I think Jenny gave a couple of things there. Really the opportunities, if we produce more milk per cow, the methane per unit of milk tends to go down. We can lower cow numbers, obviously. That probably isn't real popular with dairy producers to lower numbers, but that would work. Improve feed efficiency, and that was mentioned, and there's a big USDA NEFA project out of Michigan State looking at improving feed efficiency in the dairy industry and building some databases for it there. And decrease the number of non-productive days. Can we decrease the number of non-productive days? They eat feed, they produce methane, but they aren't producing any milk. Some examples, and we can't go through every one of these in detail with the time we have. Milk cows three times a day versus twice has some impact because it changes intake and, re and feed relationships. May improve feed efficiency slightly. Productive efficiency we'll touch on, and uh, Julio was talking about that, I think, uh, either right now or sometime this afternoon. Things like somatotropin, uniform grouping, healthy animals. An animal that is not healthy has a lower feed efficiency. 
which means a higher risk of methane emissions. How we manage those cows right around calving, so the ionophores that may have some impact. More accurate ratio formulation, mixing delivery. Quality, age, first calving, these type of things. And we can make that list longer and longer and longer, and we can go into each one of these in a lot more detail. But if you take a look at that little quick, you see most of these are good, normal management practices. They're not too exotic, okay? Now, how much can we reduce it? Well, Joanne Knapp and a number of other people put together a, a paper here in the last year or so looking at lots of data and trying to estimate if we change different areas, what's the potential for decreasing emissions? And their summary was that genetic selection maybe could decrease the uh, methane per unit of unidirected milk, maybe 18%, give or take. Feeding nutrition, maybe 15. Some of the rumen modifiers, they said five. Other management strategies, some of those we'll touch on here, 18%. And if you add them all together, and they're not assumed to be added, maybe we're up to 25, 30% by using combinations of these. They also, in that same paper, tried to take literature data and develop some relationships or guidelines or, or, or so on. For example, if we can increase dry matter intake, for each uh, couple pounds we get more intake, we decrease the emissions per unit of milk two to six percent. And that ties a little bit also to feed efficiency. Forage particle size doesn't matter, seems to be fairly neutral, whether it's small or large on that one. Processing the grain, if we can improve sto total starch digestibility in the animal and get more of the feed starch used in the animal and less in the manure, if we can increase total crack digestibility 5%, it lowers methane 1 to 2, two or 3%. So you, you say, well, some of these are pretty small, but if you get two, a couple of them going together, maybe it's, it helps. If you really want to lower it on a dairy cow, take and make the rumen pH less than 5.5 you will decrease methane rapidly. You will kill cows rapidly. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, it works, but it's not something we're going to go to the field and implement, okay? And feed more grain. And again, if we feed a, little, a touch more grain, we, we improve some efficiency in the rumen, we lower that methane to some extent. But we have to be careful there. We don't feed too much more grain and get up at the here and then cause that other problem. So some of these you say, well, <laughs> that looks good, but it really doesn't fit practical management and cow health. Improved forage quality, if we can improve digestibility of the fiber, the NDF, if we can increase that about five units, and that's within the range of what we see uh, in forage lab data, or is methane per unit milk around 5%. Well, that's a good normal management practice anyhow, because you get more use of your forage. Forage types and selection may alert, you know, a few percentage. <coughs> and fat feeding, if we add some added fat, that may lower methane per unit of milk. Again, there's a point beyond which we add the fat, it becomes negative. So we have to put the whole these in perspective. Okay. Alex Histral did a different approach used a ranking system and said, what practices have a low potential to reduce it less than 10%, which are medium 10 to 30% reduction, and which are high greater than a 30% potential reduction. The low options were things like bovine somatotropa and some meonophores, and you can see the rest of these. So those, they all have an impact, but they're probably less than 10% opportunity to reduce the emissions per unit of milk. Okay. Medium to high mitigation options, forage quality, balancing grain to the forage to optimize the rumen, precision feeding, do a better job of mixing the ration to the specs and getting the delivery of the cows. The medium option in his was the, the fats, the dietary lipids, and the one that had the high in his case was increased productivity which goes with feed efficiency. 
improve feed efficiency, productivity is really one of the ways to win the game. There is a relationship, as you would expect, that the more the cow eats, the more methane you produce. But that is total, and if you look at it in terms of per unit of milk, it tends to go down. For example, here, as you go up from a lower level of milk to a higher, your methane per unit of your carbon footprint per gallon of milk goes down, which is an index of the greenhouse gas emissions. Okay. Now, productivity. We're going to zip through a lot of these really quick and simple, taking some literature data that we can find and seeing if it gives us some indexes. There was a paper that said if we can get a one standard deviation increase efficiency, we can lower methane emissions six, seven percent. Well, that six, seven percent becomes pretty important. Somatotropin could lower methane maybe eight percent, and that sort of fits in the range that that Alex said that this would be less than ten percent. The challenge on that one is in many of our markets, they're restricting dairymen from using that that practice. <coughs> Higher quality forages, lower methane emissions per unit of forage fed. Sometimes if, if we put in some corn silage rather than a grass or legume, it may lower methane. But then you've got to go back to the whole farm and say, does it fit the land base, the resources, the rotations, and everything else? So it may say that going all corn silage is really great from a lowering methane. It may or may not fit the whole farm situation of all the land resources and everything else. So I think really in forages, my take, the first step, select the forage be grown based on the agronomic and environmental considerations. If you're in southern tier of New York on a hillside, you probably don't want to grow corn silage. You want to grow grass. The next step is to produce whatever forage you pick and make the highest quality possible. And I think that's how you're going to do it. So you're not going to pick just one forage for all farms. Other herd management things. What we said about 10 to 30 percent of the total methane is from dry, dry cows and replacement heifers. Bill Weiss from Ohio State estimated that if we reduce age at first calving two months, it lowers methane emissions disease in the herd about one and a half percent. Well, lowering age at first calving is a good management practice anyhow because if they calve at an earlier age, we don't have to raise as many heifers to maintain herd size. If we can reduce the culling rate in the herd by 5%, Bill says we can lower methane maybe 3%. Well, again, lowering culling rate is a good management practice because it means you've got more healthy, more productive cows. Here's one option. You can just take the heifers and get them off the farm. And that's going to lower the emissions on that particular farm, aren't they? <laughs> Assuming what? <laughs> Assuming what? Oh, wait a minute. I got a barn over here, and it's empty, and I got forage over here. I think I'll put more cows. If they did not add cows, that would lower emissions for that farm. But those heifers are still fed someplace. So for the total air population, you still got the heifers, right? So do you want to calculate the farm data or the industry data? But if they move the heifers, you think they might add some cows? Use that forage, maybe? Uh, Phil Garnsworthy in the UK has, has done a lot of work looking at the effect of reproductive efficiency, and I think Julio may be talking about some of that in his talk also, on methane and ammonia uh, production using UK data. And he really compared the current pregnancy rate, how many of the cows bred in a 21 day period conceive. 19%, um, that was 2004 data, versus 1995 was 25%, some reduction. In his evaluations, which also looked at replacement inventory and two levels of milk production. So he looked at the preg rate, replacement inventory, and levels of milk production. If we can move pregnancy rate up back to the previous level, he calculated a 4, four to 11 percent reduction in methane emissions. So again, a good management practice that, by the way, helps us 
lower methane emissions in the herd. Now, <clears throat> we're getting towards the end here. Feed additives and removal modifiers, I didn't want to spend a minute on this because I know many of you in the room have looked through some of the scientific <coughs> literature and there's hundreds of different compounds people have added in vitro and these things knock methane down 30, 40, 50, 60, 80 percent in vitro. Really significant. Okay? The question is, number one, that's in vitro, how does that work in a cow? And secondly, that short term, how does it work long term in a cow? And I think before we get too excited about these, that's what we have to look at. At the dairy science meetings a couple weeks ago, Alex Driscoll from Penn State gave a paper, which is like the first one I've seen. Maybe Joe or Wendy have seen others. This is the first one I've seen. They did a 12-week trial, which is relatively long compared to the in vitros. And they used a, a compound, uh, 3-nitroxate propanol, which went in and had some impact on the room books. And they went in at 0, 40, 60, 80 milligrams per kilogram of feed. They did this for 12 weeks with cows man averaging about 100 pounds of milk. Methane emissions were reduced 25, 31, 32 percent. So there's promise here. Now this is not ready to go to farms uh, at this point in time, but it says maybe some of these compounds have some potential long-term effects. But we need more data like this to help sort that one out. Okay. But at least it's encouraging that there may be some possibilities. Uh, grouping people at the University of Wisconsin, Vic Carrera and his associates have looked at a lot of grouping. And what they found is you might expect if you have a herd of cows and you feed them all the same ration versus feeding them two or three rations and more closely balanced their levels of milk, as you include more rations within limits, it makes the system more efficient and current converting feed to milk. You reach a point above maybe three or four groups that doesn't seem to help a whole lot. But it does improve both the income over feed cost, which is profitability for the dairyman, and it also increases efficiency and lowers potential uh, emissions of methane. There are a couple recent papers where we have to get back to what economics. And they've indicated in these two recent papers, one California, I forget where the other one's from, that taking the current feed and milk prices and their models and adjusting rations to lower methane emissions, it actually increased feed, feed cost and lowered profitability. Now remember, when you do the economic calculations, you always have a milk price and feed price. Those things are really variable. So if you raise one, lower one, you're going to get co totally different answers. So I think we have to put this into our thinking pattern as we look at some of this, because what we need to do is be able to keep that dairyman profitable at the same time we impose herd management and lower the methane emissions. Because if it's going to be implemented at farms and all of a sudden it lowers their profitability by a whole lot, it's not going to get a lot of reception. And this may be farm specific, so I think we have to do a lot of work with individual herds. I think we have to go back and do more of this. But these say there may be cases where it costs the dairyman money to do this on a herd management nutrition point of view. So we have to look at this more carefully. So to wrap it up, I think the long-term approaches on a dairy farm are genomics and genetic selection to improve feed efficiency. Right now, it's hard to select sires for feed efficiency because they're not ranked that way yet. So as this project completes that they're working on and sires become available, we can select for feed efficiency, that will be a tool that dairymen can use. There may be ways to alter the rumen microbial population. A lot of work to be done there. What the possibilities are. Size-wise, we're not sure. Some of the added compounds may offer opportunities, but I think, again, we're not a year or two away from a lot of these. 
and altering herd management like your replacement program and reproduction. Those take a little bit longer time, but they do have potentials to help us lower the emissions per unit of milk produced. Short term, improve feed efficiency is one of the key ones. Use fiber starch digestibility when we balance rations to take better advantage of the different feed fractions, more digestibility, less methane per unit of feed. Utilize additives and products based on research that are available to us. Decrease the number of non-productive days and do our best job with forage type and forage quality. So I think those are the ones that are going to win. Provide feeding and management systems that improve comfort, herd health, and reproductive performance, and do the best job we can of precision feeding, mixing the ration correctly, feeding it correctly to the cows, so we minimize the overfeeding that's going on in some of the herds. So that's where we're going to stop and see if you have any questions or comments.